Welcome everybody to this fantastic event that I'm very excited about being part of and moderating Strength Through Unity, Asian and Latino Americans Finding Common Ground. Sort of strange for us to be having this virtual discussion. I wish I could see the audience, but I see that there are a few dozen of you out there. My name is Sonali Kohatkar, and I am the host and executive producer of Rising Up with Sonali, which is a daily radio and television program produced by KPFK Pacifica here in Southern California. I'm also a writer. I do a weekly column for Independent Media Institute, and I was invited to be a moderator for this event uh, that I'm very uh, pleased to be um, you know, overseeing and, and very excited about the distinguished panel of guests that we have today. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, later on, you will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, in the chat box, and we're going to try to take some of those questions. Uh, the purpose of this event is for us to to really highlight the fact that there are communities of color in this country that have historically, of course, been invisibilized and scapegoated. Uh, but you know, when we've had moments of solidarity, when we've had unity with one another, we've been stronger together. Um, so many issues coming up on a daily basis in the news, but also historically, and we want to draw some of those connections and, uh, and think about what lies ahead. Uh, it is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month this month in May. Of course, we're near the end of this month. Uh, and this is a month that is meant to recognize the contributions and the uh, influence of Asian Americans and Pacific Islander Americans to the history, culture, and achievements of the United States. Uh, and it's especially critical due to the current rise of discrimination against Asian communities, against Latino communities by President Donald Trump during the pandemic um, and even before that. And while stereotypes and, and language and culture and even food have kept us apart, we have a lot in common with one another. And the hope is that through events like this, we can gain so much more by collaborating and participating and partnering with one another. We have many common bonds and ways to cooperate uh, with one another so that our communities don't get left behind in American society. So today during our discussion, we're gonna be talking about our shared history of discrimination in this country, uh, the contributions of uh, communities, particularly Latino and Asian communities, how it pertains to our current political landscape, and also our how our culture and our heritage is part of our resilience. Um, I wanna thank our hosts and our partners. Uh, the event, This event was produced by Innovate Marketing Group and LAVA. Uh, KPFK is also a sponsor. A very big thank you to Innovate and LAVA for their partnership in making this important discussion possible. We also wanna thank and recognize our event partners, Asian American Professional Association, Asian Pacific Community Fund, US Guatemala Chamber of Commerce, and of course, KPFK. And, um, I mentioned earlier that uh, those who are in, a, in attendance among our audience can ask questions. In your toolbar next to your screen, you can submit your questions in the box called questions. And uh, we're gonna try to get to some of those in the final five, 15 minutes of our program. So without further ado, let me introduce our distinguished panel of guests. Um, I wanna first introduce Renee Tejima Pena. She's an Academy Award nominated filmmaker, a professor of Asian American studies at UCLA, and the series producer of the groundbreaking docu-series, Asian Americans. Her previous films include Who Killed Vincent Chin, My America, or Honk If You Love Buddha, and No Mas Bebes. Her films have screened at the uh, Cannes uh, South by Southwest Sundance Film Festival, and Toronto International Film Festivals, and the Whitney Biennial. And actually, before we go to our other guests, we want to um, play for our audience a short clip from Renee's docu-series, Asian Americans. Larry approaches Cesar Chavez and his colleague Dolores Huerta, another powerful organizer. Come on up, brothers. We are waiting for you. As one of AWOC's co-founders, her relationship with Larry and the Filipinos goes back years. And then a couple days later, we're at this church. They're talking about the strike. They're discussing, should we go on strike or not go on strike? And all of a sudden, there's this Walga. I said, what the heck's Walga? Because I thought they were saying, hell no. I said, no, it means strike. We're going on strike. And so the Mexicans joined us. Come on, come on. Where are your brothers and sisters over here? Come on. Come on now. 
They take the Mexican labor movement and the Filipino labor movement, they create the United Farm Workers. And they really push that the workers eat together, they have meetings together, that they were um, picket lines together. And it was only because of they become one union that they were able to win the strike. Well, I think that it's great, and thanks to the co-op store that have been supporting the grip boycott uh, to help uh, bring about justice and dignity on behalf of the farm workers. For me, that's one of my pride and joys. Yeah, Filipinos were here, and we made a difference. Working in the fields. That's where I realized that if a lot of people put their mind to it, they can win. I left field working behind me completely. But I never left the memories of these guys. And that is a short clip from the groundbreaking docu-series Asian Americans by one of our panelists, Renee Tajima Pena. And she'll be telling us more about that once our discussion gets going. Next, I want to introduce Moctezuma Esparza, an award-winning filmmaker, producer, entrepreneur, and activist, revered for his contributions to the movie industry and commitment to Latino representation. Esparza established Maya Cinemas, a chain of modern movie theater complexes with a focus on providing mainstream entertainment in Latino-centric underserved communities. And a few of his production credits include Selena, Introducing Dorothy Dandridge, The Milagro Beanfield War, Gettysburg, The Battle of Gregorio Cortez, and Walkout. And then our third uh, panelist is Robert J. Alvarado, a Southwestern history novelist and author of Young Pistolero, Proud of his Hispanic ancestry, Alvarado's passion for Southwestern history radiates into his writing, particularly stories from a Hispanic perspective. Well, those are our three panelists, and I want to kick off the discussion today by asking Robert to start by giving us a historic overview. You know, we saw a little bit of history from the clip from uh, Renee's film of Asian Latino solidarity, a moment in California history. Um, but uh, go, you, you're a historian and someone who writes historical fiction. Give us a broader historical framework of moments like this, of solidarity like this between our two communities. Uh, th uh, thank you, Sonali. You know, my perspective has been from uh, studying, like you said, everybody is saying that uh, we are invisible in our history. And uh, so I, after I, I retired from the computer industry, I, uh, I started looking around and I found a, a man by the name of, of Alfago Baca. I don't know if anybody has heard of him, but he, as a 19 year old uh, young man, uh, heard in Western New Mexico, the uh, Texans were uh, harassing the people there. As a matter of fact, they castrated a young man and so he went there to put a stop to the atrocities. And when he got there, uh, they, he arrested some of the cowboys. And when he came out of the uh, Justice of the Peace after turning into the cowboys, they hold him up in a mud shack, a hot gun. And they held him there for 36 hours and they shot 4,000 bullets into that mud shack. And uh, him and a, after 36 hours, him and a statue of St. Anne came out unscathed. He killed several of the cowboys. And eventually the, the sheriff came and stopped the whole thing. And to me, I, you know, I took him as a hero. And, I, and, and what I try to do in my writing is bring out heroes that we can all look at and say, hey, you know, we have, a, we have people that, uh, that we can look up to, okay? And so from that, I took on a writing historical fiction of a young man that uh, uh, 17 year old from a, a Mexican Northern state where the Haciendero uh, raped his 15 year old sister. He took out his father's flintlock pistol. This would have been in 1866. And he shot the Haciendero, took his uh, Appaloosa stallion and headed north to El Paso towards his uh, uh, uncle's ranch. 
Well, the saga begins there, and it's incredible what he went through. You know, the prejudices in Texas, and not only from Anglos, but also from Spaniards, because he was a mestizo. He was half uh, uh, Indian and half Spanish. You know, we are we have a lot of mestizos in the Hispanic community, and in those days, they were like nothing. And so, my story is about about him. It's an eight eight uh, part saga that go through his life and, and how he uh, became resilient and, and persevered with his life. And, uh, and that's, that's what I wanna bring to everybody is say, hey, let's write some stuff that uh, feels good, not depressing anymore, okay? Right. And that, that's what I wanna bring to Asians and Hispanics. Hey, we need to start writing and producing uh, films and sagas or whatever to make us feel good about ourselves. So our, all our we're... panelists are, are storytellers in a way. So I want to turn to yeah. Renee. Uh, we saw a clip of your docu-series, Asian Americans, which gave this glimpse of what happens, what can happen when two communities that might not even be aware of how much they have in common, discover that commonality and find strength in unity. Tell us more about your series. Yeah, well, even apart from the series, I think you asked for you know the historical context of the the relationship. So if you look at the the histories, the common histories of migration of Asians and Latinos, and as well as especially labor migration. So you have in as early as 1903 the Oxnard Beat Strike, which was led by Mexican and Japanese workers. And you have down the line, um, you know, ethnic studies, the uh, fight for ethnic studies, many labor um, uh, mobilizations like the fight, the farm workers movement. But at the same time, there are tensions. I mean, in the farm workers, in the, the grape strike, there were Nisei, Japanese American growers. The interesting thing is there were Nisei, second generation growers who were anti-union, very much, you know, resisted the strike. On the other hand, there are Sansei, third generation, younger generation Asian who came out of the Asian American movement who supported the strike and who were, were marched along with them as, as boycotters. So there's there's always been that that tension. And I think for Asian Americans, you know, we because of this the model minority myth that's been used as a wedge against other people of color, we've kind of had to reckon with this question of um, the degree to which we enjoy racial privilege vis-a-vis -vis black and brown uh, Americans and you know how we I mean in the series which goes over 150 years of Asian American history and does deal with some of these um, points of solidarity we uh, Viet Tien Nguyen talks about you know Asian Americans really have a choice to make like do we side with power do we side with the predators or do we side with justice um, and, you know, that's a decision that we have to reckon with, you know, ever since we came to this country. So, so, you know, in summary, there's been these points of solidarity and, I mean, the immigration history is, you know, Asian Americans were the first so-called undocumented immigrants, which we look at. I mean, in 1882, the first group of people who were banned from entry to the United States only based on race were Chinese, the Chinese yeah. Exclusion Act. And then if you fast forward today, the fastest growing segment of undocumented immigrants are Asian. Um, the first dreamer whose story we tell is Teresa Lee, who inspired the first Dream Act in 2001. She's a Korean immigrant who had been actually born in Brazil. So, um, you know, on the one hand, we have these commonalities, on the other hand, in order to really get the work done, um, we have to be clear about the points of, of difference as well and, and the work that we have but to do. But I'm so glad you brought up this issue of our shared immigration history because, and, and the fact that there is a racial hierarchy, sadly, whether we'd like to admit it or not, Asians have been used, you know, through this model minority myth as um, a wedge to show up against other communities of color, against black communities, against Latino communities. And then, of course, when we have moments like the moment that we've just had with the pandemic, when Trump has decided to demonize uh, Asians and his base has followed suit, uh, Asians, um, you know, found themselves uh, unfortunately as the most 
a reviled community among, uh, you know, and the target of white supremacists. And so depending upon the way in which history is flowing, any one of us can be and have been targets. After September 11th, it was South Asian and Middle Eastern communities or Arab looking, Muslim looking communities. Um, and of course, today with the brutality, racist police brutality um, against black folks, we see that history, um, you know, that, that, that we've seen that historic brutality continue on today. And of course, with uh, undocumented immigrants and the Latino community, we've seen tremendous um, discrimination. We have really, I think, to underscore that there is strength um, in unity and in strength in lifting one another up and, and in expressing solidarity. But Robert, I think you were also uh, referring to that a little bit that uh, whether it's through historical fiction or through the screen, through television or film, how critically exactly. important is it for especially young people of color to see yeah. themselves on screen and to also see those characters on screen not give in to the stereotypes that um, white supremacy has placed on us? Because when people of color have been on screen in roles written for them by um, white writers, we've tended to just fulfill some, you know, fantasy, but not been true to ourselves. Exactly. You're absolutely right. Now, if you, if you look back after the civil rights, the battle from the African Americans, you know, they gained a lot of respect. And if you look at uh, uh, the sports industry, they dominate all the sports. They, they are the best athletes and uh, and, in, and in today's world, if you look at television sitcoms, they have uh, commercials. I mean, they are doing really well. It's because, I mean, they fought for it, okay? And it seems like in our community, Asian and Hispanic, we don't fight for each other. You know, it seems like we're not helping each other get to that next step. And, you know, we need to persevere in that area. We need to, like, I, like in my writing, you know, I, I'm writing positive things from a Hispanic point of view, where it could be put on screen, and uh, and that that's that that's where we need the help. As you well know, uh, television is a powerful tool. So. Renee, uh, speaking of those positive stories, as a documentary filmmaker, um, there are lots of stories, right, that haven't been told. I mean. Uh, for example, when we think of the Japanese American incarceration uh, here in this country, and especially in California, we have so many stories. I remember when the family separation issue for undocumented immigrants under Trump started being recognized by the public, Japanese Americans were on the forefront of expressing solidarity, of saying never again, we know what it's like to be caged and separated from society. Um, and I thought that was a really important expression. And I'm wondering if, you know, that was amplified enough. Well, you know, I mean, there have been films specifically about the kind of the solidarity of um, the Japanese Americans based on their experience in World War II and um, their, you know, fighting against the detention of families at the southern border. And that's one thing we take up in one of the episodes of Asian Americans. So we follow. Um, Satsuki Ina, who was born in one of the camps in World War II, um, one of the Japanese American incarceration camps, and she's become a real leader in the fight against the um, mass detention of families. There, there's actually in the series, and again, you know, if you look at our parallel histories, um, one of the stories we tell uh, of the early history in the early 1900s, Connie Young Yu, who's Chinese American, um, tells a story of her her grandmother who was married to a U.S. citizen. Her grandfather was, you know, Chinese American, born in in San Francisco, but um, the mother was an immigrant. So when he passed away, and the family was returning from a visit to China, they were stopped on Angel Island. She was kept on Angel Island in detention for 15 and a half months, mm -hmm. separated from her young U.S.-born children who had to return to San Francisco. And, you know, Connie talks about that's the, the, the harshest punishment you can give a parent to separate them from their children. And those are the stories that Asian Americans really, you know, remember and completely connect 
to the mass detention and separation of families today at the border. So in June, the Japanese Satsuki and a group of Sudo for Solidarity, a group of Japanese American, big group of Japanese Americans actually were going to descend from around the country to Washington, D.C. to demand that the, the border camps be closed. They can't do it now, uh, but they're going to have a virtual event. But those kinds of, they've been going to like Dilly, Texas, and, and she went to Carnes, the detention center there. She went inside and talked to the mothers and children. So that work has been on, ongoing. I want to um, ask the two of you about um, the fact that while we have these specific racial groups, these communities, um, and we talk about, you know, tensions within the communities or between communities, and then of course, the impacts all of us. Um, we also have class issues at stake, which intertwine and intersect, and I feel like that's so important. Um, communities of color experience gentrification disproportionately, Part environmental racism, um, you know, are in terms of just uh, wages and access to healthcare. Right now, during the pandemic, we see that so-called essential workers were forced into the, their workplace, even when it was unsafe, even though they were the lowest wage, were primarily people of color. And so that in wealth inequality and those class issues as they're intertwined with race issues, you know, the fact that people of color are most vulnerable, especially black Americans most vulnerable because of existing health discrimination and health disparity that systemic racism um, contributes to. Those are conversations that I feel like we don't have enough of because we're supposed to buy into the American dream, everyone for themselves, this immigrant idea of, you know, coming to this country, working hard and making our way to the top. But, uh, you know, to to white supremacy and the white, white supremacist worldview, every single one of us is otherized and, you know, is invisibilized. So that's, I feel like that, any thoughts on that, Robert? Boy, I, that's a really, really tough question, isn't it? I mean, if you look at the disparity, especially in the black communities, if you look at New York, uh, a lot of the larger cities are all stacked on top of each other. And, you know, what kind of opportunities do they have, you know? The ones that escape out of there, like most immigrants, you know, they do well. But once they're stuck in those uh, high-rise apartments, and you know, I, I had a chance to live in Toronto, Canada, back in in the early 70s. As a matter of fact, 1970, and even there, uh, high-rise apartments and, and the minorities were you know, from Pakistan and from other uh, uh, countries. They just were stuck pretty much, you know, even though Canada is supposed to be very, uh, very liberal and open to everybody, you know, they were stuck. They couldn't go anywhere. And then and, here in Southern uh, California, it, we have people that are priced out of their homes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It was the same way in, in Canada, in Toronto. It was so expensive. And I was an engineer up there and I was making in, in 1970 about $14,000, uh, 14000 uh, a year. And I couldn't buy anything. I mean, they were taking over half uh, my my pay in taxes because of socialism that was, you know, they had great health care. Everything was taken care of pretty much. But I couldn't make enough money to buy a house. So eventually, after four years, I came back uh, to, the, to the United States. But, yeah, it, you know, the, the disparity with the black uh, African-American communities is awful, especially in New York. I said, Chicago, look at what's happening in Chicago. They're killing each other over drug wars you know it's it's awful it's awful you know and and what can we do about that i mean you know we have the same issues with hispanics and barrios here in phoenix and uh it, it's you know Renee, there's a lot of like programs to jump i'm in. sorry go ahead. i'm done oh, yeah go oh, ahead. okay um yeah you know for asian americans i think what's critical to look at is we're on both sides of those class disparities so, I mean, since I guess the 1970s, the United States has become increasingly, um, you know, the, the rich and the poor, like the, the extremes have become much more extreme. Asian Americans are the most disparate um, population of any American population. So you've got, it's like a barbell. You have on the one hand, some Asian Americans who are even maybe in the 1%, you know, high income, highly educated, doing fine. 
And then on the other end, you have Asian Americans who are being left behind, um, you know, do not have educational opportunities or living in poverty. And, and so, it, you know, and when I talked about that kind of question of privilege, I think that's, I mean, we're talking mostly about, I would say, like some South Asian groups, like maybe from India, as opposed to Pakistanis and Bangladeshis, and East Asians, as opposed to like uh, Filipinos and, and Southeast, Southeast Asians, who are enjoying that privilege to, uh, I think, a disproportionate extent. Um, so you've got, like, in terms of relationship with the Latino communities, you have, um, in like Koreatown, Korean um, business people who are employing both Asian and Latino workers. And you have questions of, you know, the working conditions and wages and um, efforts to organize. Actually, there have been um, multiracial efforts to organize, like Kiwa, uh, the Korean Immigrant Workers Alliance, who work with Latino workers as well as, as Asian workers. Um, but, you know, for Asian Americans, that, again, is a part of the reckoning of, you know, in our choices, do we choose to side with power? Do we, you know, there are Asians who own property. Um, and, and we, of course, you know, have our, a history in, in, in this uh, part of the country with, our, with the 1992 riots and the tensions yes. between Asian and Black community. Yeah. 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 So so it's it's complicated, but I think that that's been a part of the conversation recently is looking at both privilege and but also the commonalities and then trying to figure out you know just figure out a way forward i mean i can't I, emphasize that enough I, I feel like it doesn't have to be that way though and one of the things that i found so heartening considering what's happening right now in minneapolis i just want to kind of bring up this story that caught my eye today that you know, we know that on Thursday, the police precinct uh, building was burned. A couple of other buildings were burned. Protesters are very angry about the killing, police killing of George Floyd. And one of the buildings that was burned was a restaurant owned by an Indian American. Uh, it was a South Asian, an Indian restaurant called Gandhi Mahal. And the daughter of the owner posted to uh, social media saying, thank you to everyone for checking in. Sadly, Gandhi Mahal has caught fire, has been damaged. We won't lose hope though. I'm so grateful to our neighbors who did their best to stand guard and protect Gandhi Mahal. Don't worry about us, we will rebuild and recover. And then she said that she overheard her father on the phone, the owner of the restaurant saying, let my building burn. Justice needs to be served. Put those officers in jail. She goes on to write, Gandhi Mahal may have felt the flames last night, but our fiery drive to help protect and stand with our community will never die. Peace be with everyone. Hashtag justice for George Floyd, hashtag BLM. I was so moved when I saw this post. To me, this was the most important kind of solidarity. A business owner whose business is now destroyed, hopefully he has insurance, um, to say that justice for this uh, you know, person who was killed by police was more important than his restaurant. And to say it out loud, that's the kind of expression of solidarity I really feel like we need more of. So, so one of the, I mean, it's 3.30. So another pivot that I wanted to take, which I think is so important, we're in an election year. And over, I feel, especially sub, since September 11th, the last 20 years or so, we've seen a shift in the electoral, in the political clout and electoral power of communities of color. Um, various uh, non-white communities who might have been tilting Republican have been tilting more and more Democrat. And uh, you know how you have writers like Steve Phillips who writes, uh, who's, who's written about the political power of communities of color. How important is it for that electoral power, that coming together to actually achieve political change? It's one thing to have cultural change. It should go hand in hand with political change though, right? Robert, uh, Renee? Yes, yes I, I totally agree. Uh, it's, uh, you know, from uh, as a writer, I'm an observer. I, I kind of look at the world and, 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 and I've seen something like, you know, Donald Trump got elected because of a backlash. Don't you agree? Yeah. I mean, be because yeah. Of I, and, because of a fear that people of color were going to be a majority by well, 2040. It, it wasn't, it was more than that. It was more about jobs. From, like I said, I'm observing what he says, right? It was like, okay, we're bringing back 
uh, factories back to the mid to you know to the middle America again to to put people back to work with real jobs. And that's what he kept saying. And you know what? Those people believed it. And so you know, from like I said, I observe, and I, and, I, and, I'm, and you know, that's what I bring to to the world is in my writings. I observe what's going on, and and to me, it was a it was a backlash that that's how he got elected. He was saying the right things to the people in Middle America, and so if we're not careful, he'll do it again. You know, so what do we do to stop it? You know, you can you can write all you want, and people can organize or whatever, but if you don't grab that Middle America you'll get reelected again. Renee? You know, I've seen a lot of change just during this COVID period. I mean, so a f last year, a few months ago, a lot of discussion among Asian Americans was like the rising conservative movement, like the Chinese Tea Party, et cetera, et cetera. But there's been this real, I think, and maybe I'm just in my bubble on <laughs> social media, a real sea change. I mean, so the COVID crises and the characterization by Trump and the the GOP of the Chinese virus, so-called, and the Kung flu, um, just put a target on the back of Asian Americans. And so there was a lot of discussion, you know, right from the gate about, um, you know, anti-Asian hate and the whole history of anti-Asian hate. More recently, I think the past three events that I've been on or watched has started with tributes to Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and now George Floyd. And these are okay. Asian American events, speaking specifically about anti-Asian hate, but it isn't, it's not bad anymore. I mean, Asian Americans are looking at justice as not being just us. That's always been true. I mean, that history of solidarity with other people of color, you know, it goes back the over a century. But I think there's been a sea change. So there's more um, people who, you know, maybe a few years ago would never say the word white supremacy. I mean, because it's just so clear. I mean, it's just so stark now. Um, I think that that People are really getting woke, and I'm talking about Asian Americans, and so they're thinking about the the fight against um, hate and discrimination towards Latinos, towards African Americans, other people of color, as being the same fight as being their fight, and the, the allyship as being just you know just essential. Um, you know, like what Fannie Lou Hamer said, it's it's you know nobody will be free until we're all free mm -hmm. um but but and it's interesting to see asian americans who i am kind of surprised are taking up the banner are you know much more willing to stand up in that way my let me say hello to all of you and renee congratulations on a fabulous documentary series Thank i've you. seen it and it was deeply moving so uh yeah, I, I wanted to offer an insight about where we are today and what I lived through um, 50 years ago. And that was reflected in your documentary, Lene, which was the Third World Coalition uh, that was focused on in, in the late 60s. And it showed up at UCLA, right, where the Asian Americans and the African Americans and Native Americans, uh, all of us together, created the ethnic study centers at UCLA. And that was repeated in many campuses across the country because we saw clearly uh, that we had a common history uh, and we had a common future, either together successfully uh, regaining our rights or together going down in flames because of the way the country was going. And it right now feels like it felt 50 years ago. There is a tremendous yearning for all of us to have justice, uh, to be recognized as human, uh, to be accepted as part of the human family. And that same angry uh, ugliness that existed 50 years ago where people died where people were being killed, where the police was targeting us, is coming up again now. The, the difference is, is that we have tools. We have 
more power. We now have made that progress uh, from where we were then uh, to a time now where it's not going to be invisible because everyone has a camera and the recording that everyone has is changing the reality for all those good people who thought that everything was okay and who were living in a little bubble uh, thinking that uh, the relationships that they had with the police were the same relationships that everybody had, which is not true, right? So uh, just as we all lived through the, the rebellion of 92 here in Los Angeles, I lived through the burning of East Los Angeles in 1970. My first student film was about that murder of Ruben Salazar, uh, the LA Times reporter and KMEX newscaster, uh, which resulted in Whittier Boulevard and East LA going up in flames, which is not taught or even talked about anymore. And there were multiple deaths. And the Sheriff's Department and the LAPD were responsible for those deaths. So we have been living with more than 500 years in Asia, right, and in Africa of colonialism and exploitation. And in the Americas, it's now it's 1519 is when Cortez invaded Mexico City. It's over 500 years now. That we have been living with the sickness that Cortez described that he had, which was an absolute hunger for gold at the expense of everything and everyone else. That was a disease that he described the Europeans had an avarice, an avarice for possessions that was more important to them than human beings. And that's a really good uh, segue for me to bring up what I was talking about earlier, which is that we're seeing in this moment of the pandemic where our government is very clearly putting profits over the lives of people. Capitalism has driven the society. And of course, the most expendable among us are communities of color. We haven't even talked about Native communities, Native American communities who've been so hard hit with the Navajo Nation having the highest per capita rate of infections, uh, coronavirus infections, and of course, Black Americans having the uh, one of the highest uh, fatality rates. And so these are, you know, and yet we're told that it's their deaths are worth it because the country needs to reopen. So I feel like that issue that you just brought up, that historical backdrop is continuing today and it's constantly profit is built on the backs of communities of color, some more than others, right? We've seen native communities, black communities face the most historical um, uh, and, and, and extreme oppression that Asian communities have as well, Latino communities have as well. Um, and so uh, one of the important things for now, for us to sort of try to work toward is what are those ways in which we can express solidarity? So Mark Zuma, I wanna kind of give you a little extra time since we didn't get you for the first part of the conversation. What, what is your take on, on the importance of showing solidarity in this moment, that when communities of color, when Asians and Latinos see African-Americans being gunned down, being killed, being strangled by police, that we need to see that as our pain as well. Even if our communities aren't experiencing that at the same rate as the black community is, that solidarity is so critical, right? Well, I mean, the first thing to recognize is that we're all one, we're all one family, right? Literally and figuratively. Right, so Native Americans, the, all of the science now points clearly to the fact that our ancestors are Asian, right? So when I did 23andMe and I got my little breakout of what my background was, it was said they're Asian or Native American. So that is our ancestry. Uh, Native Americans is a misnomer in the way that the United States uses it because it's also a, a legal fiction. You have to be a recognized tribe. The largest depository of Native Americans is in Latin America uh, because that's where they were not all killed, the way they were almost completely killed here in the United States, exterminated. So I start there that as a, a Chicano, my ancestry is Asian, African, European, Middle Eastern, that we are all one family. And that's where I have to start, that we need to recognize that ultimately our distinctions is what makes the human race 
exciting and worthwhile where our creativity gets expressed, but it comes from a commonality that we are one people. So I start there. And when we did this 50 years ago at UCLA and we created the first uh, third world film program, Ethnocommunications, that visual communications came out of, right? And I was the organizer of that program. We had four Asian Americans, we had four Latinos, we had four Native Americans, and we had four African Americans. And that first program started uh, what I think is flowered for many of us into claiming our own image, claiming our own history, claiming our own story, and sharing that with the world. Um, so I want to uh, start taking some questions from the audience now. Uh, we've had some come in as well, but for those who uh, jo who joined us a little bit later, uh, if you want to um, submit some questions for our panelists or for myself in your toolbar next to the screen, you can submit your questions in the box called questions. And, uh, and we're going to try to get to some of those. Um, Rosetta Henderson um, asked about uh, the assault on black men in the U.S., which I feel like we've uh, talked about quite a bit. Um, and I would only add to that, that, you know, when any one of us are witness to the kind of racist behavior that um, Amy Cooper was engaged in, that, that even if we aren't involved, we get involved and, and step up and, and speak out in solidarity with one another, because we've all been there. Probably every single one of us have been the victim of, of, of hate speech and, and wished that bystanders would get involved and, and step in. Um, uh, and, and another question by Eddie said, do you think it's important to have minorities represented in government, such as in the city and county administration, and not just elected roles? And why do you think there's a lack of representation there? Um, and, um, you know, and so we talked about electoral power earlier. We have more representation in Congress after the 2018 midterm elections than we had before. I mean, just just the presence of the squad, right? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, and Ayanna Presley has made a huge difference to the discourse. But what about these local level um, positions of political power? Any one of our panelists want to speak to the importance of um, our communities represented there? Renee, Robert, Moctezuma. All politics is local. Yeah. So we have local power in order to have national power. You organize always one by one at the local level. You can't do it any other way. That's what I learned from Cesar Chavez and Fred Ross and uh, how I was trained, that you do it one by one locally. That's what the GOP did. I mean, they school boards, election commissions, you know, very much on the local level. And that's how they built power. Yeah, and they have a state by state strategy. Um, yeah. And I feel like I, I just want to bring this up. I don't know whether you all agree with me or not. I feel like one of the problems uh, and the obstacles to our progress is sadly the Democratic Party. I mean, we the only options we have of aside, you know, <laughs> We, 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 most of us reject the white supremacist agenda of the Republican Party, but unfortunately the Democratic Party takes the votes of communities of color for granted, doesn't enough speak to the issues that concern us because we're expected to vote blue no matter what. And I feel like that's a real problem. And so insurgent candidacies like those of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to challenge the Democratic Party from within, make it a more diverse party, make it a more progressive party, will actually help the cause of all communities of color and, and building solidarity is critical. I mean, for our communities to vote for candidates of color, whether they're from our direct communities or not, if they're progressive, if they're uh, a diverse uh, candidate of diverse background, that's that's important for us, I feel, to, to challenge the Democratic Party because, you know, they take us for granted. They always have. And we're at a new stage in our development at this point. 50 years ago, there was the Peace and Freedom Party. There was a Raza Unida Party. There was uh, uh, efforts uh, by the Black Panthers to have started a political party because we couldn't get in because they kept us out. At least at this point, we're inside. Uh, Ocasio is inside the Democratic Party. Okay, Bernie Sanders is inside. And that is huge progress that we now have to build on. 
that we each we have a responsibility to continue. A uh, great question by Alfred Ramirez um, to ask, please speak to mixed race and intersectionality. Uh, I think this is a really important question because as our country gets more and more diverse, we have more uh, cross-cultural uh, relations and intermingling and marriage across racial boundaries, children of mixed races, my own children are mixed race. and you know, and, and, and we see the country in general becoming more and more um, difficult to categorize into separate boxes. Our boxes are, are the lines between our communities are blurring. Um, is, that, is that something that, that can be a powerful um, thing for the future, a powerful force for the future? Well, it's the human norm, come on. The Neanderthals and Homo sapiens also um, coupled that is what humans do. Uh, so throughout uh, all recorded history and prehistory, we have always been one family on the planet. So that is not new. Uh, it's not new today. It wasn't new a thousand years ago or 10,000 years ago. I, I do no, want to I say, oh, I'm so sorry. My I was neighbors, say gardeners are right outside. <laughs> That's okay. So no, I was going to say, you know, if you watch sitcoms and commercials, uh, there's a lot of mixed couples. Have you noticed? You know, so More television, something. like I said, is very powerful. Uh, uh, so yeah, that, that's that's where we need to. I mean, television is so powerful that we need we need a voice there, really, Evie. So I want to pick up on what Moctezuma was saying because uh, although we are, you know, obviously race is a social construct, but of course the way society views us, the way white supremacist um, systems view communities of color, we are always judged by how we appear. We are always judged by the color of our skin, by the name uh, that we bear, by our accent, by our gender, by how we express our um, sexuality. And, and that's where, of course, the problems come in. And challenging that is where storytellers like yourself in, in um, you know, busting those myths and stereotypes makes such a difference. I am so tired of watching the homogeneity of Hollywood over and over again. Even though we have more mixed race couples represented on screen, mm -hmm. I feel like it's not enough. I want 100 years or 50 years at least of, 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 of mm -hmm. lead cast members that are not white. <laughs> um, one more question from uh, a, uh, one of our audience members. Um, what about business associations, um, Asian business associations, and the role of chamber organizations? This is an interesting question because often you have progressive um, causes that uh, can get undermined when the US Chamber of Commerce steps in and weaponizes small business organizations where communities of color have small businesses against progressive issues. I'm thinking of, for example, you know, the plastic bag bans in California where non-white restaurant business owners were brought in to speak out against this, even though communities of color get impacted most. But at the same time, communities of color are small business owners. Um, they get left behind and Congress constantly invokes them when it comes to distribution of, um, of, of subsidies or taxpayer loans, as we've seen during the COVID crisis, but they do get left behind. Um, is it important for us to talk about small business owners within our communities? I think that's been really going, going on. I mean, I know during Asian businesses were really hit hard by like restaurants and, and markets by the COVID crisis and this characterization of the Chinese virus. And um, there's been a lot of mutual aid and support for those businesses. I mean, I was on a, uh, there was a, a virtual rally that this past weekend, they were trying to raise a million dollars for Asian small businesses. They started that rally with the memory of African-Americans who had been you know, lynched basically by the, the police. They, that's how they started. And there were, you know, old line, like lefty Marxist Leninist people out of the Asian American movement participated. And also, you know, young kind of YouTube celebrity types and, and rappers. And so it was like really diverse. And I thought it was so beautiful because of this focus on, you know, these small businesses are the heart of our communities. 
and we have to, and they're often our families. You know, a lot of us, you know, work in the family restaurant or the family store. Um, and so in, in even fights before this and the fights around gentrification in Asian communities, like in Chinatowns, you know, there's been that kind of alliance. Um, so I, I'm very hopeful and, I mean, it's such a shit show right now, but I think that people are talking about how are we gonna emerge from this moment and with you know innovative, not even innovative new ideas, but I think people are more open to ideas of um, you know even if they were kind of conservative of like universal basic income or universal health care or you know just changing the way we we look at our alliances in terms of race i think people are open to that because everything is so catastrophic mm -hmm. right now so this is probably a good time for people to you know start making those alliances right a sort of reverse shock doctrine if the if the powerful elites can take advantage of us in moments of crisis we too can take advantage of the crisis to demand those things that were deemed impossible another great question from the audience um, what is the responsibility of asians and latinos and african americans who are fortunate enough to be in the one percent to exercise their influence in our collective community issues um, i'd love to take that up and then ask our panelists. Um, I'm thinking of the um, African-American uh, billionaire whose name escapes me now, who one of the things he did was forgive the college debt of um, a historically black university as his deed, you know, good deed. And while those things are great and they do impact, you know, the direct people impacted to have your college debt wiped out because a wealthy person from your community was generous, it doesn't address the system uh, systemic issues of why so many communities of color and young people of color are ridden with college debt. And what I would like to see from the one percenters of color is to challenge the very system that allows billionaires, and now we know that Jeff Bezos is gonna be a trillionaire in a few uh, years. Why do we tolerate a system that allows this obscene wealth inequality to continue and to, to see that they are the exception rather than the rule. That you know, that's what I would like to see from billionaires of color, if you will, uh, or even one percenters. I believe you have to just be making something like three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year to be in the one percent. Um, to 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 see their success connected to an unequal system that must be dismantled. Um, Moctezuma, did you want to throw your uh, opinion into the ring? Well, obviously, if you have had an experience of growing up uh, poor and you manage to build a life and wealth, you know what that is. And so it is far more likely that all the people who are of color, who have reached some sort of economic success, have that compassion. They have the experience of what it is to be poor, what it is to be discriminated. It's it is at least what my experience is, is that they have always uh, been in touch with that part of their life and their history. I was fortunate enough to be the chairman of the Numeric Alliance, which is a leading Latino business organization. And we got together because we recognized our obligation, our actual obligation to give back to our community and to help bring everyone that we could individually along with us and to lobby for education, to lobby, to change what would be fundamentally uh, the power structure of the country. I believe that uh, it is more likely than not that people who are people of color who have succeeded continue to have that social conscience. Absolutely. I, I'm I Robert agree with and Renee, we have yeah. just a few minutes left, so okay. go ahead, Robert, last thoughts. No, I, I was just going to say I agree with Moctezuma. I grew up poor and, uh, you know, when I went to, uh, got out of the Air Force and started university, well, I thought I was going to get the GI Bill. Well, they didn't have it at the time. So I worked from four to midnight for six years to get an engineering degree. And doing, and then, and then being successful after that, yeah, you know, people from my neighborhood, there were some young kids that couldn't go to college. So me and some friends that my colleagues that uh, I went to school, we helped them get started. Okay, and, and, but we were just small. We were just a small group. But Moctezuma it had more power. You organized it, and, which was fantastic. And you know, I was never able to to uh, accomplish that. But yeah, I totally agree with you. 
Uh, Renee, uh, your final thoughts? So we've uh, just three minutes left in the hour. I think we all have to um, think outside our own personal interests if we're if there's going to be change. You know, whether you're in the one percent or not. Um, I think that that's my final thought. It can't justice is not just us. Um, you know, I also feel like we uh, the importance of political education is critical. I mean, and social media helps, but social media also hurts. Um, there, there's too much information, and unless you're reading the right sources, um, sure, social media helps uh, share the stories of injustice, but it also helps, unfortunately, spread conspiracies or hate speech. So political education, political awareness, um, journalism, political journalism, I, I really want to, I mean, sort of, being biased here, given my own background, I want to emphasize how critically important it is um, to also have people of color, not just telling the, the stories on television and in the pages of uh, novels, but also on screen, on as journalists, as, as thinkers, as panelists. Um, that's so important because we have to educate our own communities. Asians have to tell our children why George Floyd's um, killing is important to us, uh, and and you know you imply that apply that to so many other issues. Latino Americans, you know, can can look at the discrimination facing Asians with the COVID pandemic and draw those commonalities and talk to our children about it and and spread those issues. Um, so I, I really feel that that's so so important for us to be visible, to be united, to to speak with one another and to speak uh, to our own, you know, to our shared experience, uh, to stand up for one another, to not stay silent. That's so critical. Uh, we cannot be silent in the face of injustice. We have to stand up for one another because there is so much strength in that. I mean, the, the, the powers that be want us to be fragmented. They want us to be individualized and be powerless and, and, and think only of ourselves. They don't, don't want us to form collective strength. So I guess that is a good note to end on. Any last thoughts? Anyone want to throw out websites? Renee, uh, how can people see your film, Asian Americans? Um, PBS.org slash Asian Americans. And I want to say one thing that the <clears throat> I'm a professor at UCLA, UCLA's Asian American Studies Center has created a website, uh, COVID-19 resources in 40 different languages, Zapotec, Spanish, Burmese, um, Farsi, you name it. So I, I included in the chat, the um, link for that website. So please pass the word around. Montezuma, you want to throw out a website? Uh, well, I just want to say that this is an example of the fact that we have a conversation about all of us being together and struggling together to bring justice for everyone. And uh, I want to thank each of you because each of you are carrying that flag, that torch forward. And uh, Sonali, for your continuance. Uh, I have a deep love for KPFK. I had my own show on KPFK for seven years, from 1968 to 75. Wow, um, I did not know that. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. Robert, your last Good. thoughts? You want to throw out a uh, website where can people find your work? Yeah, uh, it's called youngpistolero.com. And uh, you'll see some uh, feel-good uh, historical fiction from a Hispanic point of view. And, uh, you know, I've gotten some really great reviews for it. Uh, Edward James Oldmo's organization selected it for a TV drama series. But, well, you know, that takes lawyers, guns and money to make something like that happen. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, go look at it and, you'll, and it, you'll, you'll find it's good reading and good historical stuff. Well, thank you all so much. And a big thank you to our audience as well for your participation, for watching, for your questions. Our uh, panelists have been Renee Tajima Pena, uh, Moctezuma Esparza, Robert Alvarado. I'm Sonali Kolhatkar. And a big thank you again to Innovate Marketing Group and Lava for their partnership and for making this important discussion possible. Thanks also to our event partners, Asian American Professional Association, Asian Pacific Community Fund, US Guatemala Chamber of Commerce, and KPFK. And have a great afternoon. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.